All right, John chapter 3, of course, probably the most famous chapter in the entire Bible. Um, lots of people are very familiar with this, but let's dig into this. I'm going to try to hurry up a little bit. There's a lot of content I want to get to. Um, so let's get going here. John chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So here we have this conversation between Jesus Christ and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, again, he's a, he was a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. Um, but he comes to Jesus by night. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but we're going to see, we're going to go to some more references of Nicodemus. This isn't the only time that we see Nicodemus in the Bible. We see him in, in two other references in the book of John. And um, I believe that, that somewhere along the not line, Nicodemus gets saved. Now, first we see him here. You know, oftentimes you see the Pharisees, they're trying to catch Jesus in his words. They're trying to just, you know, they have hatred for him. They can't, you know, they despise what he's teaching. Um, that's, that's kind of mostly what we see with the Pharisees. But we do know that people were getting saved. I mean, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, right? He was of that sect, and he was, he was learning that religion and, and, and really um, studying it, and has gotten pretty far along in that religion before he got saved. Um, so there's definitely Pharisees were getting saved, and I believe this is one of them. But we see here, he came to Jesus by night. And the reason being is because there's so much persecution, there's so much debate, and, and so many of the Pharisees and the chief rulers of the synagogue, they didn't like what Jesus had to say. So I think, you know, the reason why I'm saying he came there by light, night is because he didn't want to be seen. It's not something he wanted to just be exposed openly that he's going to talk with Jesus and have these conversations. But you even see in his manner of speech, he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So he's acknowledging the fact that Jesus is doing these miracles. He's not attributing that to Satan, you know, as some of the other ones do. He's not attributing that to, you know, to Lucifer, that he's the son of a devil or anything like that. He's, a, he's, he's given them credit. You know, hey, we know that, that you're a prophet because no one can do these miracles that you're doing unless God's with them. And I believe he's honest in this. And again, you see in other places, there's Pharisees and scribes and they tempt him and they're trying to say these things and they'll butter him up and they'll say, oh, master, we know, you know, like we know that you teach the truth. And they say these things just to, to gain his confidence, but they're really trying to trick him. But I don't believe Nicodemus is doing this. He goes at night, he goes to talk to him, have his conversation. But we're going to see um, in John chapter 7, we see another place um, where Nicodemus is mentioned. This is the reason why I believe he, he's saved is from these other mentions as well as what we see here in this scripture. In John chapter 7, verse 44, it says, And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Talking about Jesus Christ. They wanted to arrest him. And um, it says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, never man spake like this man. So when, when the officers were going to go, they were going to lay their hands on him and arrest him because the Pharisees and the rulers, the chief priests, they wanted him to go get arrested. But then when they came back, they're like, where is he? Why didn't you arrest him? And they're like, never man spake like this man did. You know, they, they couldn't arrest him. They, they had nothing to say against him, so they were afraid to even arrest him. And then they're like, oh, what, are you his disciples too now? And then in verse 50, we see Nicodemus says, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, referring to John 3 here, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. So here we see, you know, he's kind of taking Jesus aside because, you know, they're looking to arrest him. And he's saying, well, look, it's not, you know, that's kind of against our law. Shouldn't we at least give him a chance to, to, to say you know, to face what he's being accused with or to hear him, to know what, he, what he's doing before we even jump to conclusions and go to, and go to rest him. So we see him here kind of on his side. But then in John 19, this kind of clinches it for me. We see him, um, this is after Jesus Christ died on the cross. In John 19, verse 38, it says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So Joseph of Arimathea, it says there, you know, he was kind of a wealthy man. He's the one who buried Jesus in that tomb where no one had ever laid before. He, he, was, he was given the permission to get the body of Jesus Christ and put it in that tomb. It says he was a disciple, but it was private. 
People didn't know that. People didn't know that he followed Jesus Christ because, because of the Jews, because he feared the Jews. And we see the same thing, I believe, with Nicodemus, that he also had a fear of the Jews. He was a Pharisee himself, and he feared you know, what his colleagues, what other people were going to say about him, because there was a lot of persecution arising over what Jesus was saying and people who believed in Jesus. And then that verse continues, it says, Now this is Joseph you know, beseeching Pilate and getting the body of Jesus. And then it says in verse 39, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes and with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So we see Nicodemus here helping Joseph out with, you know, with the burial preparations and everything of Jesus Christ. He obviously cared about it. He obviously cared about Jesus Christ's body and just giving him a proper burial and everything else that he went with Joseph and, and they too prepared this body. So again, I mean, it doesn't say anywhere that Nicodemus believed on Jesus Christ. So I don't know if he's saved, but you could kind of see these other things that happened. You know, if he wasn't saved, he was definitely sympathetic towards him. But um, anyways, we, and it's interesting, too, that he's brought up multiple times in the Bible. You know, he's, he's not just a nobody. He's, he's someone that's mentioned both times by name and specifically referenced as, hey, this is he that came to Jesus by night. This is he who came to Jesus by night. And you think of the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3.16 is in context of Jesus Christ speaking with Nicodemus. Now, John 3.16 is so popular because everybody uses John 3.16 when they go out soul winning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see Jesus Christ in this whole chapter when he's speaking with Nicodemus, giving Nicodemus the gospel. I mean, I use so much of John chapter 3 when I go out soul winning and talk to people. This was given directly to Nicodemus out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. And again, that's another reason why I think, you know, a lot of people rejected that. But we see here, Nicodemus didn't just reject his word. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been doing these other things later on in the book of John, later on after Jesus died. If he was just flat out rejecting it. Um, I, I don't think that he'd be mentioned and showing this stuff. Anyways, um, I'm going to keep moving here. Verse number three. So verse number two, basically, um, Nicodemus is saying, you know, we know that, that you know, no one can do what you can do except they're from God because of, because of the miracles that he's doing. And then in verse three, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto, unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So right here, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, look, a man is not able to go to heaven, a man will not see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Now, Nicodemus doesn't understand this. So it says in verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? He doesn't have this understanding. And um, he says, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's thinking of the physical, right? Obviously, we all have one birth, and he's like, I'm a grown man. Like, I'm not going to be able to fit back into my mother's womb and be born again. He's like, what are you talking about? You know, you have to be born again. I, he just couldn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus answers. He clears it up for him. He says, verily, verily, in verse 5, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou, bear, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So Jesus answers him, because Nicodemus is thinking in the physical. How can I physically be born again? No, no, Nicodemus, it's not what I'm talking about. So that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. He's speaking of a spiritual rebirth. You see, we all start off, when we're born, we have, we have our body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Now, just as with Adam and Eve, do you remember in the Garden of Eden, when they were told that they were able to freely eat of all the trees of the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They said, if you eat of that tree in that day, the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. That was God's commandment to him. He says, look, that very day you're going to die. Now, when they took and ate of the fruit of that tree, did they physically die? No, they didn't. So obviously, when God said, in that day thou shalt surely die, they did not 
physically die. And this is, again, this is going to come in real clear here with, with being born again. It's not physically born again. They didn't physically die, but they did die. God's word did not, it, was, it just didn't pass. You know, people think, oh, yeah, see, God said they were going to die, and they didn't die. Yes, they did die. Their spirit died within them. Okay, that is the day, the moment when they, when they disobeyed God, when they sinned, their spirit died. And you know what? That hasn't changed today. The only difference is that they were full-grown adults because that's the way God created them. Right? I mean, they didn't start off as babies and grow up as children or whatever. But when we're born, we have a living spirit inside of us. That's why Paul said, I was alive once without the law. But when sin, when, uh, but when sin came, the, oh man, I got it. I don't have it memorized. Um, I was alive once without the law, but when sin came, um, basically he said I died, right? The, 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 um, man, my blind is just drawing a blank now because I know that verse too. But what he's saying there is that spiritually we're all born alive and that's the same reason why like infants and babies in the womb and, and little children, when they die, they go to heaven because their spirit hasn't died yet. They're not held accountable for their sin. So it's, it's when you sin, when you, when, you first, when you first sin against God, when you understand you know, right from wrong, when you, when you have this, this, this age or this level of accountability where you can understand, hey, this is wrong and I shouldn't be doing this, when, when, you could, when you could grasp that concept, whatever age that may be for people, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's different for everybody. But when you, when you could understand the concept of sin and going against God and going against what, you, you know, what you're commanded, um, that's the day that your, your spirit dies. Now, we need to be born again. We need that spirit revived in order to, to be saved, in order to go to heaven. And this is what he's talking about. So, the day that, that we sin, the first sin we do, that's when we spiritually die. Well, we need to be spiritually born again. And um, this is exactly what he's talking about. Now, a lot of people will look at this verse in, um, and they try, I've, I've heard people try to use this as a justification for saying, see, you need to be baptized to be saved. Now, first of all, did anybody see anywhere the word baptized in, in John chapter 3 as we read it? Well, I mean, later, yes, there is. There's a reference to baptism. But... Up to where Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus, is there anything mentioned about baptism? Because there's not. I didn't see the word baptized anywhere. But this is what they say. In verse number 5, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. They say, see, see, born of water. That means baptism. What are you talking about? Born of water. Okay. Real quick. I mean, this, is, this is a real basic science lesson. Does anyone know what it's called? right before someone's physically born and a woman's water breaks, right? There's water sack in there right before a child is physically born into this world. That's what he's talking about, born of water versus born of the Spirit. And he couldn't even make it any more clear because on the next verse, he says exactly that. He says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So first he says, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. The next verse, that which is born of flesh and that which is born of the Spirit. So he's obviously saying, hey, that which is born of the water is that which is born of the flesh. And if anyone ever comes to you trying to, to show you and say, no, see, look, we have to be baptized to be saved. No, he's talking about that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's just a physical birth. Obviously, for us to be saved, first you have to be physically born on this, on this earth. And then you, you, know, you get spiritually born, um, born again by putting your faith in Christ. And again, okay, so becoming a child, I kind of covered this in John chapter 1, but let's just flip back there real quick to John 1. Because Jesus said that uh, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, when you're born again, when you're born into God's family, God becomes your father. You become his son or his daughter, right? So if you become his son when you're born again, look at what it says in John chapter 1 verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So those that, be, that have the power to become a son of God are those that believe on Jesus Christ. That's when you're born again. That's when you're born of the Spirit. That's your, that's your birth into God's family. 
And of course, you have to be born into God's family in order to see the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ is trying to explain here. So let's keep reading here. Um, man, I'm doing actually pretty good with time. I thought I was going to take a little bit longer on that point. John, uh, verse number 9. So Nicodemus then responds. And he says, uh, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Now this is a real important verse to understand because Jesus is basically rebuking him saying, you know, Nicodemus is he's understanding like, how can these things be? He's just explaining to him about being born again, about being saved, and he has no idea what he's talking about. He says, how can these things be? And Jesus is like, are you a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? Saying like you are, because he's a Pharisee. He's supposed to be a, like a rabbi, a teacher. He's supposed to be a teacher of God's word. And he's saying, look, you're supposed to be able to teach these things and you don't even know the most basic truth about being born again? About just, just being saved? He's like, how, how is that possible? And this proves too, again, that, that people will tell you, oh, they were saved by obeying the law and all this other stuff in the Old Testament. No, they weren't. If they were saved by obeying the law, how could Jesus have expected a Pharisee to understand this concept if this is something new? If all of a sudden, saved by grace, this is just a brand new thing. There's no way he could have expected Nicodemus to have already understood these things before Jesus even, even talked to him about it. Before Nicodemus even approached him, he's saying, how could you not know these things? I mean, that's like someone coming in. You know, if you, if you talk to a, a pastor or a minister of another church, right? And they're the ones teaching. They're the ones getting up behind the pulpit. They're the ones reading the scripture. They're the ones that are supposed to be teaching the flock. And they're, they're not even saved. And they don't even know anything about it. Wouldn't you be like, what are you teaching? You don't even have the most rudimentary, basic understanding of the Bible just to be saved. And you're going to be a teacher over other people? You know, and, th and this is exactly what Jesus Christ is saying unto Nicodemus. Now, the other point is because I just mentioned about um, people twisting John 3, 5 to be talking about baptism. Well, baptism, guess what? Baptism was a new thing. That started with John the Baptist. They were not baptizing people in the Old Testament. That was not anything that was come about. It was something that knew that started with John the Baptist when he started baptizing people. And um, that's where he was getting so much attention. You know, even the Pharisees and other people were coming to John, you know, asking, why, do you, why are you doing these things? And um, so it wouldn't make sense, again, going back into that mindset of thinking that, like, uh, we need baptism to be saved. And baptism was a new thing, but then Jesus rebukes him, saying, you know, art thou master of Israel, knowest not these things? How could Jesus have expected him to know, oh, well, you need to be baptized to be saved, too, if it was something that was brand new? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Both ways, it doesn't make any sense. For the people who believe that, that people were not saved by grace through faith in the Old Testament, what Jesus said doesn't make sense for that. Or for people who think that, well, of course, you have to be baptized to be saved. Well, it doesn't make sense for that either, Jesus' response. He could not have expected Nicodemus to know that since baptism was a new thing. But that's obviously not what he's talking about. He's not talking about baptism, about being born of the water. He's just talking about physically, that of the flesh. Now, let's keep reading here because there's another real... Um, verse number 11 says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know. And testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Verse number 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Excellent verse. For one, this verse proves the deity of Jesus Christ. Right? Because he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, the Son of Man is who? Is, is himself. It's Jesus Christ. Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So while Jesus Christ was on this earth speaking to Nicodemus, he says the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You know, I am in heaven, and I'm here speaking with you. Now, again, it's a, it's a hard concept for a lot of people to grasp, but it's the truth. And Jesus himself said it. And, and we were talking to you know, Jehovah's Witnesses today. They don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. They believe that he was someone else. He's, oh, he's just the son of God. Well, they should have been here tonight because we could see another verse here, another scripture saying that no man hath ascended up to heaven, but the son of man, um, even the son of man, which is in heaven. He claimed himself. Now, either Jesus Christ is a liar or he's God in the flesh. 
Because no man can be in two places at the same time like that unless they're God. Unless he was God manifest in the flesh, being capable of, of, of being in both places at the same time. And um, now, this verse, there's so, man, there's so much in here. This verse is tampered with in just about every single one of the new versions that are out there. And I have just a few examples for you. This is another one to show people of, of things that do. Now, most of the ones that, that, that we like to show people, I like to show people are verses that's completely just stripped out of the Bible. But this is another really good one because people say, oh, well, you know, it just makes it easier to read or easier to understand. You know, people have that argument. Well, they say it's not that big of a deal, the stuff that's changed. It's, it's really not a big deal. Well, I think that this proof of Jesus Christ saying the Son of Man, which is in heaven, is a pretty big deal. Listen, listen if you could spot what's missing from the NIV. The NIV says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. That's it. There's a which is in heaven is missing, right? Even though the, I'm going to get to the rest of the wording later because the wording isn't even right. The New American Standard says no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Again, the deity of Christ is missing. It's chopped off the end of that verse. The New Living Translation, no one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. It's, again, completely different. Now, that in itself is huge because it's destroying this great reference to the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. But the other thing that they're doing, and this is well, so many people, I just had someone comment the other day on, um, and try to use this verse as an example, saying that, because, um, you know, people of all time, if you're saved, when you pass away, when you breathe your last breath, you go to heaven. You go straight to heaven. There is there's this false doctrine where people believe, oh, no, really, people in the Old Testament, they went to paradise. And paradise is actually in the heart of the earth. You know, like right next to hell. And this place of paradise that's in this burning, fiery furnace, somehow, but it's not really hell. And it's called Abraham's bosom. It's like there's a sign up there that says Abraham's bosom. And, um, and this is what they believe. It's ridiculous. Like, like uh, not, maybe not about that sign, but you know, they say, oh, yeah, you go to Abraham's bosom, and Abraham's bosom is the heart of the earth. Because they don't understand Scripture whatsoever. And they get this from that story of, um, of Lazarus and the rich man. You remember when in Luke 16, um, where there was the, the poor man, Lazarus, and the dogs licked his sores and everything else? And then the rich man, they both died, and Lazarus goes to heaven. But it says he's like he's in Abraham's bosom, which means, guess what? I mean, bosom is a body part, right? A bosom. That would be like my chest, my breast, right? So when I give my wife a hug, or if she's like standing here and, I, and I've, I'm kind of got my arm around her, you'd say she's in my bosom, right? I mean, it's just like John rested his head in Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper. It's a body part. It's a place. It's not a, it's not a physical, geographical location. Like, you know, you're not going to say that, that hell in the center of the earth is a bosom. It's, that's, it's hell. It's, just, it's a place. It's completely different things. But, um, but people believe this, and they think that, like, now people go to heaven in the New Testament because they see the New Testament scriptures, but, but back in the Old Testament, they didn't. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on why they believe that, but it's really silly. But... Um, why am I getting off on that for this? Um, oh, right. So that's what I was preaching on. And, and they say, because they say, no man hath ascended up to heaven. And this is the, the verse that they'll use as to why they believe. This is, this is one of the main verses. They'll say, see, no one has gone to heaven except for Jesus. And that's, and that's what these new verses say. Now, in the King James, it says, and no man hath ascended up to heaven. And I'm explaining the difference here in a minute, but it's not the same as NIV saying no one has ever gone into heaven. Okay? No man ascending up to heaven is not the same as no man ever going into heaven. And I've got some proofs for this. In, turn, if you would, please, to 2 Kings chapter number 2. I want you to see this. I want you to see the words for yourself. 2 Kings chapter number 2. We're only going to turn to... Two or three, two places basically, three places, two, exam two, two examples from the Bible of people in the Old Testament that the Bible says they went to heaven. 
And again, you see the error and the contradiction in these new versions. When you could point to one place that the Bible and says one thing, and then you see something else somewhere different, it's completely contradictory. Hey, it's not God's word. First of all, God's not the author of confusion. Second of all, God's perfect, and His word is perfect. He doesn't contradict Himself. God doesn't change, and God's not a liar. So one of those two places where we're going to see um, one of these verses would have to be a lie in, in those new versions. But look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse number 11. Talking about Elijah, it says, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So where did Elijah go? In heaven. That's what the Bible says. There was a chariot. I mean, these are angelic chariots came down of fire. Right? This isn't some normal, this isn't just like a physical chariot came and, and whisked them away. No, I mean, chariots from heaven came down to receive Elijah and carry him up to heaven. Now, I had someone say, oh, no, no, see, because basically they just dropped them off somewhere else on the earth. And the Bible says that where? It says that nowhere. It says he went to heaven. And um, they even went and searched. This says this, when Elisha returned, you remember, that, there's a great story because Elisha saw this and, and Elisha asked of Elijah, said, hey, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah's like, hey, that's a hard thing. But if you see me get taken to heaven, then, you know, you'll, you'll get that blessing. You'll, you'll receive that. And he did. He saw them. Elisha saw it. So Elisha's returning. He's got the staff in his hand. He's saying, you know, the God of Elijah, you know, like. He said, where, you know, like, where is the God of Elijah? And he, and he smote the waters and the waters parted for him. And he crossed back across the Jordan River. And um, so he goes back and then the sons of the prophets were there. And they, they're saying to him, you know, hey, we need to go and find Elijah. Because, because it, was, it was common with Elijah where the Spirit of the Lord would take him, you know, like and kind of hide him. And... You know, he'd be fed with the ravens or whatever. And, and he was protected and, and kept from harm's way oftentimes um, by God. But we always see when that happens. So the sons of God are saying, or the sons of the prophets were saying that we need to go look for him. And Elisha's like, no. And they just, they said they, they, um, they kept pestering him until he was ashamed. And he's just like, fine, go. And then they come back and they're like, we can't find him. And he's like, I told you not to go. You know, because he's not, he wasn't anywhere on the earth. God took him to heaven and Elisha saw it. Like he, he took him out of here. He's gone. He's not coming back um, anytime soon. That is, <laughs> right? And um, so there's one example. Now, does that line up with no one has ever gone into heaven? No. The Bible says right there that Elisha did. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, and then we're going to flip over to Hebrews 11 right away. Genesis 5 and Hebrews 11. Genesis 5, 24, we see what happened with Enoch. If you remember with Enoch, this is, this is way, way, way back early in the, in the days of mankind with Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, look at verse number 24. It says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And Hebrews 11 explains this a little bit clearer. So turn to Hebrews 11. Um, basically, Enoch pleased God. He was walking with God. He was a righteous man. He was, he was you know, living a godly life. And God decided just to take him. Silence. And look at 11, Hebrews 11, verse 5. It says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, again, this, this translation, that translation is his body. He's received his new body. God translated him and took him to be with him in heaven. He didn't send him down to Abraham's bosom. God's throne is in heaven, right? That's where that, and, and that is clear as day in the scripture. God's throne is in heaven. There's, God's throne is not in hell. I mean, yes, does God exist there? Yeah, because he's omnipresent. He's all over the place. But God's throne is in heaven. And if he is going to take Enoch to be with him, why is he going to send him down to Abraham's bosom, so to speak, in the middle of the earth? It doesn't make any sense. So both of these examples of people from the Old Testament, 
they got they they went they went to heaven, and it couldn't be clearer than Eli than Elijah's story. But um, so we see in Isaiah says no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven. Not true. Elijah did, and every other person who had faith in God went to heaven when they died. But um, so, so what's John 3 talking about? No man hath ascended up to heaven. Well, the word that's missing in all these other ones, ascended, right? Now, we don't necessarily use ascended the same way as, as it's being used here. And I believe that, it, that the, the word definitely means this. I've, I've looked it up and studied it. Um, ascending is like ascending of your own power. So Jesus Christ ascended. Elijah was taken to heaven by a chariot. Um, we see other references in the Bible being, people being carried to heaven by the angels. But Jesus Christ ascended up of his own power, of his own volition. He, just, he ascended up to heaven. Everyone else is taken to heaven. Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. That's the key th thing, and that's the key difference. So saying no one has ever gone into heaven, that's not true. But to say no man hath ascended to heaven, that's different. And that's what this verse is talking about. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven. When he rose again from the dead, he, he ended up ascending up to heaven. And, and that's what that is. And it, and it shouldn't be that confusing. But um, again, these perversions of God's word, they change things. And, and they get, make you think that it's... Um, that it's no man has ever gone to heaven. And then, and then these people come up with these weird doctrines to try to fit that, to try to make everything fit together. Like, well, if no one's ever gone to heaven, at least at the time when Jesus said this, then, you know, where did they go? So they come up with Abraham's bosom being in the heart of the earth. Hell. <laughs> of all places, right? Of all places you come up with, yeah, people went to hell when they died in the Old Testament. What? Doesn't make any sense. Um, anyways. Off that point, let's keep going here. In verse number 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, this is a reference to Moses. Um, back when the children of Israel were, were out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness, they were plagued by snakes. So there was, there was actually this golden serpent that was made, that, that, that Moses made, where the people, when they looked upon it, after they got bit, they'd be healed. And this was all done, again, as a picture of Jesus Christ. And we see the fulfillment here, um, saying that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, because he'd lift up that staff, that, that golden serpent that was created um, for people to, to look on and, and to get healed, it was, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I've heard people use this verse and they kind of, they use it out of context. Now, what they're saying isn't necessarily a bad thing. They say, see, Jesus needs to be lifted up. We need to lift Jesus up as in like praise him and extol him and stuff. And yeah, we should. We should lift Jesus up. We should extol him. We should, you know, we need to lift Jesus up and everything else. But that's not what this verse is referring to. When this verse is talking about Jesus Christ being lifted up, it's talking about him physically being lifted up from the earth on that cross. Because that's what that, you know, him being lifted up there is um, I just lost my, it says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life we're believing in what he did for us we're believing on Jesus Christ and the fact that he died on that cross he was lifted up and died on that cross and rose again from the dead um, it's not the just praising his name right and, and if we're going to it's important that even if you're saying something that's, that's true, like we should lift Jesus up, don't ever use a verse and like rip it out of context to support that claim. You have so many other verses that you can use. Don't try to make the Bible say something it doesn't. Don't ever, because that, all that's going to do is hurt your credibility and you're, you know, in a way you're lying if you're, if you're misapplying a verse. Don't misapply verses to mean something that they don't. And um, this is important. We all need to do this because you can believe so strongly in something. Don't make the Bible fit your belief. Fit your beliefs to the Bible. And again, I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying we should lift Jesus up and extol him and praise him and everything. That's great. Yeah, I, I believe that too. But I'm not going to use a verse that's not really referring to that to refer to that. Because if you do that and someone hears you, then they go back and they're like, wait a minute, that's not really what that's talking about. Now they're going to question everything else that you've told them. 
Because why would they believe your reference to Scripture when they've already found one here where you're just really just totally misapplied? So be careful about that. Don't, you know, don't misapply verses just to, just to show support for what you believe. I mean, use, there's, there's, if, if your belief is right, there should be plenty of verses to use that are clear and that are in context and you don't have to rip them out to prove what you believe. Um, of course, verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, again, the first, Jesus' first coming, it was all about salvation. He came to this earth. He came to serve. He came to minister unto people. He came to bring life. He came to offer himself up as a sacrifice. God didn't send him to come and judge the world. And that's why you also see um, in those stories of like the woman taken in adultery, right? Jesus wasn't sent to condemn that woman. He was sent to save that woman. Now, was she guilty of her, of her adultery? Yes. By law, should she have been put to death? Yes. And if you go into that story, Jesus isn't negating the law. He ends up saying, where are thine accusers? Because first he says, I mean, he says, okay, he that's without sin among you, cast the let him cast the first stone. He didn't say don't kill her. He actually proclaimed a death sentence on her, but they were convicted of their own conscience because you know, they all knew that they had sinned. And then she didn't even have any accusers standing there. So he says, you know, there's no man condemning thee. Well, then I don't condemn thee either. Right? Go and sin no more. That's what he says to him. But he didn't come to this world to judge the world. He came to save the world, that the world through him might be saved, really, is what, is what he came to do, is that everyone have the opportunity to be saved through what he was doing and through his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And, um, but he is coming back a second time. And the second time, he's not coming back as a servant. He's coming back as a king. He's not coming back to minister unto people. He's not coming back that the world through him might be saved. He already did that. When he comes back, he is coming back for judgment. He is coming back to judge this world. And that's what people need to understand. Is, hey, look, he already came and did the work that he needed to do. When he comes back, there is going to be some serious judging going on. And there's going to be, you know, fire and brimstone raining down from heaven on a wicked world. Um... Verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And I like to go this, to these verses when I'm going soul winning. Of course, in John 3, 3, I explain being born again and how once you're a child of God, you're always his son, you're always his child. Nothing can ever change that fact. But then in John, in John 3, 16, John 3, 18, and in John 3, 36, we see these great verses that, that say all the same thing that you only need to believe in order to be saved. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but everlasting life. Very consistent with John 3, 18, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What's the difference between someone who's condemned and someone who's not condemned? Well, according to John 3, 18, your belief. Your belief or lack thereof. He doesn't even mention sin. He just says, look, you're condemned already because you haven't believed. There's those that believe in Jesus Christ to save them, and there's those that don't. Two types of people in the world. That's it. There is no in-between. Either you believe on Jesus Christ to save you or you don't. He says, those that believe, not condemned. You're free. You're saved. Done. Paid for. Those that don't believe, you're condemned. Because you don't believe on Christ. You're condemned. You're going to go to hell when you die. It says, and this is the condemnation, that the light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And I covered that last week about people not wanting to have God's truth. 
and the light exposing their evil, wicked deeds that they rather, um, you know, that's why a lot of people have that, that reaction to the truth that they don't want people to find out. They don't want their, their evil ways to be uncovered. But, um, you know, when you're doing good or you're doing right, hey, you're not afraid to have the light shine on you because you're doing good. Hey, yeah, expose the good things I'm doing. That's fine. And that's the way that we all ought to live. And the way we all live our lives is that, you know, I, and look, I am completely against all of the spying and the NSA and all that garbage that's going on and people saying, oh, well, if you don't have anything to hide, then what do you care about? Well, because I value privacy, because I don't want everyone knowing everything about my life. And I mean, I like to keep things private. That's personal, whatever. But it's not because I'm doing anything wrong. It's because I don't want to feel exposed. I mean, there's a reason why. I, um, you know, it's not, it's kind of like walking around naked all over the place. You know, you want people seeing you. Now that would be a sin anyways, but like, you know, people say, well, that, who cares? That's how you were born. That's how God made you, right? Yeah, but I'm still going to be clothed. I don't want everyone just, just, sure. there you are. And that's how the, how the government views us is just saying, well, I'm going to pry into every aspect of your life. I'm going to look at all your personal dealings and everything else. Look, I'm not for that at all, but we ought to live our lives in a way that if everything did come uncovered about our life, that we would be walking in light and say, okay, bring it on. What are you going to find about me? Right? Uh, that's the way that we ought to be living our lives, that we could, we could live a life that's above reproach. And because I'll tell you what, God sees all things. You know, the government thinks that they're God and that's why they want to see all things, but they're not God. God knows the heart and God can see all things. And remember that also as we live our lives, is that, hey, just because no one else might ever know of the sins that you're doing, you might be able to hide that from people. You may, you may not. You might think you could hide it. Either way, you think you get away with everything. God sees all. God sees everything. God knows your heart. God knows the things that you think. So remember that next time you do something or you think something, and you're just like, well, whatever. No one, no one knows that. God knows that. Um, God could see down into your heart. Let's keep reading here. Verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. So here we see again, um, real briefly, I covered this in my baptism sermon, but the reason why we immerse fully in baptism, why people get dunked completely underwater, this is one of, the, one of the proofs here, is that it's not by pouring, it's not by sprinkling. Well, if John's baptizing people, why would he need much water if it's just a little sprinkle on the forehead, right? Or if you just take a little pitcher and pour some water, you don't need to be baptizing in a place because there's much water there if, you don't, if you're only doing those other things. He's doing, he needed much water because people are getting dunked underwater. Um, verse number 25, it says, Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that's a great statement by John, this whole, this whole um, section here, because basically what's happening is John's disciple, John had a lot of people following him. He was a great preacher. I mean, there was, there was no man born like, that was greater than John the Baptist of men more, born of women. Right? That's what Jesus Christ said. John was a great man of God, a great preacher of righteousness. You know, he's out, he's baptizing. He's not afraid to, to, to preach what needs to be preached. If you remember, I mean, he gets cast into prison for preaching stuff that was hard, you know, for hard preaching, basically. And, um, you know, he had a lot of people following him. He had a lot of people just, just you know, doing well in his ministry. But basically, these people come to him, his followers say, look, you know, that guy that, that 
you know, you baptized beyond Jordan, you know, he's out baptizing and there's a lot of people following him. You know, as if like they're getting jealous for John that now this other guy is getting you a lot of attention and drawing people. And John explains, he says, look, you yourself, you can bear witness. You, you heard me say, I am not the Christ. So he's like, why are you worried about me? I said I'm not the Christ. He says, but I'm sent before him. And he explains, he that, the, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So he's likening himself to the friend of the bridegroom. Right? So you have a bride and a bridegroom getting married and the best man, right? Like John the Baptist is saying, like, I'm the best man. I'm happy because the bridegroom is here, right? That, that he's here. My joy is fulfilled. He's come. He's here. It, and when you go think about a wedding, is the wedding all about the best man? And how many people are there to support and follow the best man? No. The wedding is about the bride and the groom, right? So he's saying, it's not about me. It's about him. And that's why John spent his time pointing people to Jesus. He said, behold the Lamb of God. Look, follow him. And that's exactly what our job is today. You know, we're not some, you know, to, to think of ourselves as some great person that like, well, you just need to follow me. Well, you need to follow Christ. Now, follow me as I follow Christ, but you need to follow Christ. Right? And, and that's what, you know, we don't need to get jealous over this preacher over here, that pastor over there. You know, they've got all these people following them. Great. Well, let's just make sure we're pointing everyone to Jesus. And um, that's why I said, you know, he must increase, but I must decrease. And again, great philosophy. It's such a, such a powerful statement. If you memorize that one, he must increase, but I must decrease. Putting Jesus Christ first, making sure that he increases. And it's gonna, it could come at your expense, at your loss. Hey, I'm going to decrease. And I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm going to put all my effort so that he can increase. And, and um, you know, whatever that may mean for me, whatever sacrifices I have to make, when you make a sacrifice, guess what? You're decreasing, right? When you're, when you're giving something up, whether it be financially, whether it be your time, whether it be your energy, your efforts, whatever it is, you're sacrificing stuff. You're offering that to promote something else, not for yourself. So you're decreasing when you invest your time, when you start reading and studying and, and, and going out and, and talking to people and trying to persuade people to be saved and everything else. You're giving of yourself. You're saying, hey, it's okay. I could decrease. I want them to increase. I want this person to get salvation. I want Jesus Christ overall to increase. He must increase. I must decrease. John wasn't concerned about his earthly ministry in the sense that how many people can he build? How big of a church can he build? He wanted Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Church to build. Right? He wanted people following him. And, and that's what he came to do. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's keep reading here. Verse 31 it says, He that cometh from above is above all. And again, just, just given testimony that Jesus Christ is from heaven. Look, Jesus Christ is above all. I'm just a man. He, says, he that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. And this reminded me of 1 John chapter 5. And um, keep your finger here, but turn to flip, flip if you would to 1 John chapter 5. And it's, and it's not uncommon. You find a lot of similarities between the writings of John. You know, you have the book of John, the gospel according to John as well as the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. There's a lot of correlation between what he's writing. Um, but basically, John, John the Baptist here is saying, um, you know, he cometh from above, he's above all, and um, what, he, what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. So, Jesus Christ came from heaven. We're created beings. You know, we're created, the, you know, at conception in, in our mother's womb. God creates us, he molds us, fashions us. us, fashions us. We, it's not like we were in heaven prior to be, being born. God creates us at that moment. Jesus Christ was in heaven. He's seen, he's heard, he's spoken with God. Like, like 
you know, he, him and God are one, you know, they're, they're three and one, but um, he speaks of heavenly things because he was there. He's speaking God's word that was told unto him. This is what you're going to speak. He's given his testimony and, God, and John's saying, look, he's the son of God. You know, he's saying what he's seen and what he's heard in heaven. You know, I'm of this earth. I could just tell you what, you know, the things that I see and I hear and what's been told to me. But he's telling us things from heaven. And um, he says, what he hath seen and heard that he testified that no man received his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. So he's saying here, look, those that, that received Jesus Christ's testimony, those that believe him, believe on Christ, they have set to their seal that God, they're sealed, right? They're saved. They have set to their seal that God is true. Um, now we see here in John 3, he's saying his testimony is testimony. Well, another word for testimony is someone's witness, right? Because he's testifying, he's speaking and saying these things that he's seen and he's heard. Well, another word for that would be telling people what you've witnessed, right? Testifying of the things you've seen and heard is the same as witnessing. Look at 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 9. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, which is what we just saw, you know, Jesus from above. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. <clears throat> so those that receive his testimony or his witness hath set to his seal that God is true, just as it says here that, you know, um, we have the witness in ourselves that when we believe on the Son of God, when we believe his testimony, when we receive that testimony, and... Um, if we don't believe his testimony, if we don't believe Jesus Christ's witness, it says we're making God a liar. So 1 John 5 here explains, well, what do we need to believe in order to receive his testimony, in order to believe his witness, in order to believe that, in order to believe that record, what is the record? And he says here, there's three, there's three aspects of this. The record is that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. These are the three things that are necessary for salvation that we have to believe. And if you don't believe these things, you're calling God a liar. Number one, it says that God hath given. Given is not something earned. Given is the free gift. It's bought and paid for. It's something we just have to receive. Given is grace. We don't deserve it. We've, we've, we've received it. It's given. You, don't, you can't buy it or pay for it or earn it. It's eternal life. Number two, the word eternal by definition means forever. If you don't believe that you have life that lasts forever through Jesus Christ, you're calling God a liar. If you say, well, yeah, sure, you have to believe on Christ, but if you go out and kill someone, then you'll, still, then you'll lose your salvation and go to hell. If you believe you can lose your salvation, you're making God a liar because you don't believe that it's eternal. You don't believe that that life is going to last forever. You believe it's only temporary if you screw up. That's the Bible says you're making him a liar. And then third, and this life is in his son. You have to believe it's through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's where life is. It, it comes through Jesus Christ only. It doesn't come through Muhammad or Buddha or, or any of these other false religions out there. It comes through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through yourself. It comes through him. Those are the three things. If you don't believe them, you're making God a liar. And that's why if you receive his testimony, if you receive his witness, the witness of God, you have set to your seal that God is true, that you believe God's word, that God is truth, and that is set in your sealed, your sealed, your heart sealed until the day of redemption. And um, let's finish up the chapter here. Verse number 34 says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. We're going to close with this last verse because this is powerful. And again, another reason why I like to use this verse out soul winning is for a few reasons. Number one, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath 
everlasting life. That word hath means you have it right now. That's present tense. See, a lot of people have this false belief that, you know, oh, well, everlasting life, that's something you get after you die. And they'll think, well, if, and, and again, this gets tied into a works-based salvation. People think, well, if you're good enough and you do the right things and you don't really sin that bad and you're doing all these good things, you're going to church, then, then when you die, you'll have everlasting life. No, you have it. You have everlasting life. He that believes in hath everlasting life. Again, if you have it, if I have everlasting life right now, I have it. And then at, for whatever reason, I end up dying and going to hell. I did not have everlasting life because it didn't last me forever. By definition of the word everlasting, if I were to say, if I believe on the Son, I believe on Jesus Christ, I, according to the Bible, hey, I have everlasting life, and if I ever go to hell, I did not really have everlasting life. For any reason. By definition. Otherwise, you'd have to say it, well, you had temporary life. The Bible doesn't say, ye that believe on the Son have temporary life. It says it's everlasting. The other reason why I like to use this verse, we're going to close with this. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And I was just talking with Sebastian about this before service, is that our other job, obviously our primary focus when we go out soul winning is to get people saved. We want them to believe on Jesus Christ, put their faith in Christ so that they go to heaven and not go to hell. But I'll tell you what, it's also important when we talk to people that we don't walk away giving them a false sense of security if they don't change their belief. Like if they're, again, assuming they're believing wrong, they're not saved already, right? People who are not saved, um, especially people in these cults and stuff, it's important that they understand that they are not okay, that the wrath of God is abiding on them that they are going to go to hell if they don't change what they believe. See, it, it's too easy to get caught up in just being really nice. Because we should be friendly. I mean, we should be nice. And I'm not saying to be mean or hateful, but we need to tell the truth. And you can't hold back the truth from people because that's what people need to hear. That's what's going to save them is the truth. It's God's word. Now, the Bible says that um, on some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear. People need to hear different things in order to get saved. Some people on a compassionate approach, hey, they can see that. They can understand, you know, being born again. Most people, I think, can, can get that and believe. But other people, they need to be saved with fear. You know, the people like to think, oh, well, you know, we disagree, but it's okay because we're both saved, we're both going to heaven, and they believe in Mormonism, or they're a Jehovah's Witness, or whatever, right? I mean, they're not, for whatever reason, they're not saved, but they're clinging to a false religion. I always make it a point to make sure that I don't walk away from there with them just thinking that I'm okay with them, you know, with them thinking that they're saved, and I think I'm saved, and yeah, we have a disagreement, but we're both going to heaven. I'm going to make sure that they know that I don't think that they're saved and that they're going to go to hell when they die. And they need to hear that. And a lot of times people need to hear this because sometimes you could preach the gospel, you could preach you know, everything that Christ did for a person, you could, you could hear all this stuff, but unless a person thinks or, or has it told to them, no, you are going to hell unless you change what you believe, that might sink into their heart. That might actually get the person thinking, saying, whoa, no one's ever told me that before. I maybe, you know, maybe it's later on, maybe in that night, maybe the next week, that just rings out in their head thinking, am I really going to go to hell based on what I believe? We don't know, but, but people need to hear that, and you definitely want to make sure that you're clear on that. So this verse is great for that, because look, he that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life. If you don't believe it's everlasting, if you don't, you know, if you believe whatever, you need to do works or anything else. He says, he believeth not the Son, and again, they don't believe the record, like we just went to in 1 John chapter 5. If you don't believe the Son, you shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God's wrath. God's wrath is on you when you're not saved. And people need to understand that because there's a serious deal. And so don't, the, the, you know, the main point with that last part is just don't let people think. If, if you get this, this, this and you, you can kind of you know, feel people out, if you think, if you know that they're believing a false, just a false gospel, if you know that they're just believing wrong, and they're not saved because they, they don't believe right, 
Don't walk away from them with them thinking that you think they're saved. They might still think they're saved or whatever, but make sure that they don't think that like that you're kind of supporting their belief that, oh yeah, well he thinks I'm saved too. We just, you know, we're not agreeing on his point. No, I, I try to do my best to make sure that they understand that I'm saying, look, the Bible says you're not saved. The Bible says you're going to hell and you have the wrath of God abiding, abiding on you. Now, that may not be pleasant. I get it. Because it's not fun to talk about hell and people literally going there. Not a fun topic, but you know what? It's the truth. And that's what people need to hear. And sometimes that's what it takes for people to get saved. Saved with fear. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible and for this wonderful passage, especially in, in John chapter 3, dear Lord. There's so much here. It's hard to even get to it all, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you please just continue to open up my understanding, open up our understanding here uh, as a church, and help us all to become better soul winners. Lord, there's so many different points and aspects of, of giving people the gospel, and there's so many ways we can improve. God, I pray that you would please continue to mold us and shape us and fashion us and, and help us to just get better and better and know your words more closely and more intimately, dear God. Help us to, to, to be able to, to use all of your scripture at our fingertips, dear Lord. Whatever people are going to need to hear to get saved, I pray that you please lead us and move us. God, um, we love you. We thank you so much for loving the world so much to give your only son. Such an amazing concept of, of giving an only son to die on the cross for us. And uh, we love you. We thank you for that gift. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, one more point that I didn't get to. I wanted to. And I'm, <laughs> you know, we all are prayed and closed. But think, just think about this when you go home tonight. Think about... How much love, and, and when we sing our last song, how much love that God has for us. The love to give up His only son. I mean, think about, think about you having one child, one son. Especially for people who want to have children. You know, I have, I have three children. I love them all immensely. I can't imagine giving one of them up. I'm selfish. I do not want to give up my children at all. I love them to pieces. I mean, I, I love them so much. And then, and to only have one. So all of your love is focused on that one child. And then to allow that child to be sacrificed. Give them up. And not only give them up for someone that you love. Not like for your parent or for someone close to you. Or no. For sinners. For people who disrespected you people who disobeyed you, people who don't listen to what you have to say, for all these people who, in many cases, don't even care about you. They don't even believe you exist. Yet to still love that much to give up your only begotten son. To pay for you. That is an amazing love that I can't even fully comprehend. To love us that much. That's how much God loves us. He gave His only begotten Son to die a bloody, brutal, condemned death that, 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 that is for thieves and murderers and, and just the lowest of low people died hanging on a cross. It's a cursed death. And to allow Him to go through that and to suffer in hell is an amazing, amazing act of love for us. Don't forget that. Jesus did that for you. God did that for you so you can be saved, so you can be reconciled to Him. Share that love with others. Make sure other people understand that God loves them and wants them to be saved so much that He was willing to give up His only child to do it. That's how much God loves you. All right, let's close with our last song.